Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Summer Hacking Update, a webinar by LMG Security. My name is Tamara Roos, and I am your moderator for today. Our presenter for the webinar is Matt Duran. Matt Duran is the Director of Training and Research at LMG Security and a Black Hat USA instructor. He holds his computer science degree from the University of Montana, and his malware research has been featured on NBC Nightly News. Matt is a co author of the new book, Ransomware and Cyber Extortion. Matt, I'm passing you control of the webinar. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tamara. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, this is one of those times every year where we get to go through and talk about all of the new and exciting things that we learned at uh, DEF CON, at Black Hat, and at the B Sides Conference in Las Vegas at the beginning of August. Uh, now, again, my name is Matt Duran. I'm the Director of Training and Research for LMG Security. <clears throat> I'm also a hands on senior security consultant with the organization. Uh, Black Hat instructor, and I handle a lot of the research and development uh, along with incident response and forensic services for the organization specifically. Now, our roadmap today is going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to talk about Hacker Summer Camp. What is it? What do I mean by Hacker Summer Camp? And what do we expect to learn when we actually go down and join these thousands of other security professionals for our week in Las Vegas? We're going to talk about highlights from some of the uh, the keynotes that took place at the Black Hat conference specifically. And then we're going to talk about the major themes that we saw during our time at the conference itself. It should come as no surprise to anyone that artificial intelligence was top of mind for a lot of people that were presenting, researching, and, well, the vendors themselves down in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, we'll also talk about source code and how access to code or elements of source code are being exploited across the board by hackers to, uh, to really take advantage of a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, misconfigurations and systems cause big problems for a lot of people. We even have a special uh, appearance uh, by one of the presentations from one of our own employees. It was a zero day that we got to release at DEF CON this year, so I'm very excited to tell you about that. We'll talk about Internet of Things devices, uh, we'll talk about cloud security, and then we'll talk about new tools as we go along the way. Once we hit the end of the webinar, we'll go over things like our top takeaways and what we see as kind of the future of the landscape as we move through it. All right, so you heard me use the term already, uh, but when I say hacker summer camp, what do I actually mean? Well, at the very beginning of August, uh, traditionally in Las Vegas, and this has been my case now for the last six years, uh, there is a series of conferences that all take place uh, kind of right in a row. We have the Black Hat Conference, we have the B-Sides Las Vegas Conference, and then we have the DEF CON uh, convention, not conference. Uh, there's an important distinction there. All of these cater to different kinds of audiences. Uh, Black Hat is uh, is built as kind of the uh, the the more uh, kind of industry focused type of conference. We go through things like offensive and uh, defensive security trainings. We have a lot of new cutting edge research that comes out, and a lot of vendors that come down to showcase their new products and services and how they can really be valuable to you and your cybersecurity program as you move forward. We have DEF CON, and DEF CON is just a blast. It is a massive gathering of security professionals really gathered around new and innovative approaches to security. It's a little less focused on individual products and a little more focused on research and how we as a community kind of come together uh, to both test offensively, to protect defensively, and everything else in between. Right between those, we have the B-Sides Conference, and B-Sides tends to be a little bit more accessible in terms of the, uh, the, the presenters and the people who attend the conference. It's a great place to go, especially if you're a little bit new to this kind of, uh, this kind of industry event. Black Hat and DEF CON are both massive. Uh, B-Sides is a little bit smaller, a little bit more intimate, and it's a great foot in the door if you are looking to get into going to these big security conferences without actually having to attend a 30 to 40,000 person conference like something like Black Hat or DEF CON. Now, as the week goes, there is a plenty of things to do. Black Hat starts on August 5th and goes through August 10th. B-Sides goes uh, from August 8th to 9th, so right there at the very beginning, uh, right there in the middle, I guess I should say. And then DEF CON goes from August 10th through the 13th. It is an absolutely glorious week. Tens of thousands, literally tens of thousands of security professionals descend on the city of Las Vegas. We meet together to share research, we teach, we learn, we connect, and we really forge those bonds that are very, very important in the cybersecurity community. LMG actually had a presence at all three of the conferences this year, and that was, a, that was kind of a fun uh, selling point for us to go down in the first place. Uh, of course, we had our ransomware response boot camp, which we taught for Black Hat, uh, the, uh, the first four days of the conference. Uh, and then uh, on, uh, on Wednesday, we had uh, Tom Pohl, our, uh, our, pr our principal consultant and our penetration testing lead, uh, give a talk at the B-Sides conference. He gave us How I Met Your Printer talk, and if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend going to LMG's YouTube channel, 
to check that one out. Tom basically walks through how he can find a printer on your network and use that printer's configuration to essentially take the entire place over. Uh, it's an amazing talk. We've, uh, we've given it a bunch of times now at this point, and we always get great response from it. The other one, as I alluded to uh, previously, was a new zero-day vulnerability that our team here at LMG, headed by Tom Pohl, discovered. Uh, this is in the uh, the Dell Compellent software, and it was part of his presentation, Private Keys in Public Places. We'll go into a little bit more detail on that as we work through the webinar today. But again, it was uh, it was really nice to be able to cover all three of the different aspects of the uh, of the the uh, hacker summer camp week, basically. Now, one of the big things that we want to talk about are the big keynote speeches that we got to see at Black Hat specifically. And Black Hat is known for having wonderful, wonderful speakers with a lot of industry insight. These are thought matter. These are subject matter experts. They are thought leaders, and they really do take a lot of time to make sure that the content that they're putting out there is actionable, is relevant, and is something that we could actually take forward with us throughout the next year. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is uh, Maria Markstetter. Now, Maria Markstetter is the CEO and founder of uh, Azeria Labs, and was uh, was a, a very interesting talk to attend. The big thing that uh, that Maria was talking about was how artificial intelligence, specifically generative artificial intelligence, things like chat GPT, uh, are, uh, are affecting the security landscape up to this point. And their, uh, their, their influence is, uh, is beginning to be a little bit more visible in how we actually go about uh, interacting with security software, how we defend against attacks, and how attackers themselves can be potentially utilizing this kind of uh, technology to, well, to increase their uh, attack efficiency against us. Now, AI does not come without its problems, and this is something that's been a bit controversial in the industry specifically. One of the big problems that we've seen is public use of artificial intelligence. Something like ChatGPT kind of becomes the poster child for this type of potential data leakage, and it makes sense why. There's very little information given to us about what kind of training data is actually being used to, uh, to generate the statements that something like ChatGPT makes. And if you were submitting information, it's only logical that that information likely becomes part of that training data in one form or another. Because of this, a lot of large organizations around the world have started banning the use of things like ChatGPT within their corporate environments, or they're putting in policies that state that if you are going to use something like ChatGPT, you can't submit any uh, source code, any proprietary information, or any sensitive or confidential information about your organization. Uh, Samsung was uh, one of the first ones that we saw do this, and we, uh, we saw that Samsung had uh, had inadvertently done things like add meeting notes to ChatGPT to generate a summary. While that may seem like a very uh, efficient use of time, a good way to get through a lot of data quickly, we don't know if those meeting notes then became something that someone else could access. Uh, Apple said that uh, the artificial intelligence platform could become a potential leak source for confidential data if it was submitted. Something like source code would be a big thing. Uh, if we're trying to find errors in our code and we're submitting to an open artificial intelligence, we have no idea where that's going. Uh, Spotify and many, many others have, uh, have taken the step to limit usage of this technology. Now, when I talk about this technology, ChatGPT is not the only option out there. This is not the only game in town. We got to see multiple other examples, uh, some at Black Hat, some right before, and some have, uh, have come out right afterwards, uh, acting as kind of uh, newer or more updated versions of the software. Azure's artificial intelligence system is, uh, is kind of booming right now. Google has the BARD system, which functions in very much the same way. And if you have the Microsoft Edge browser on your computer and you start to use Bing, you'll notice that there's a chatbot feature available in that uh, that browser. This is a variation of the same GPT engine that uh, that everyone else is using at this point, but Microsoft is running it this time around. We've uh, we played around with it a little bit. It's kind of a fun system to use. Uh, now, we as security professionals are not the only ones using artificial intelligence to uh, to help us out. It only makes sense that if a tool is very useful for us, it would also be very useful for a hacker. And we're seeing exactly that happening right now. Uh, in fact, we uh, we just saw the end of Worm GPT, which is now being uh, spun off into multiple other projects. This is a, uh, a GPT engine and, and an artificial intelligence engine that is built specifically for hackers, essentially. Uh, it is being used for a huge number of purposes, anywhere from writing malicious code all the way up to generating things like phishing emails. And I bring up phishing emails specifically. This was a topic that was discussed in the uh, the Black Hat conference last year, and it came back around this year as more of a concern as we move forward through the, uh, the next little bit. Now, when we talk about phishing and artificial intelligence, there's a couple things that we need to look at here. When we're telling people how they spot things like phishing emails, there are certain hallmarks that we really tell them to look for. Some of that includes things like incomplete sentences, it includes grammatical errors, and it includes unconvincing kinds of emails. 
if we're using something that's a generative language uh, uh, AI, something like ChatGPT, or in this case, WormGPT, we can actually bypass a lot of those individual problems. We can do things like customize spear phishing, gather information quickly on someone and generate a very convincing looking email. Uh, this also means that there are fewer grammatical errors, there's a more convincing appearance, it is faster to get this stuff out the door, and if you are a low-level criminal, if you are just getting into the phishing game, having a tool at your disposal like WormGPT means that there is basically no barrier to entry for you at this point. You just tell it what you want it to generate and it does the job for you. Uh, we're likely to see a big uptick in AI generated phishing, and we'll talk in detail a little bit about that more as we move through. I don't want to I don't want to lean too hard on AI right here at the uh, at the very beginning. The next keynote that we wanted to talk about was going to be Jen Easterly from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. And the uh, the, the panel that she led, or the talk that she led, had a lot to do with what we can learn, what we as security professionals can learn about Ukraine's cyber defenders. Uh, what has the Ukraine done to defend itself against cyber attacks from Russia and other uh, nation states around the world? And what can we as security professionals pull back from that uh, in order to strengthen our own security posture and make sure that we are not falling victim to some of these more nefarious kind of nation state style attacks? Now, when we talk about these kind of attacks, what we're really talking about here is virtual warfare. This was a term that came up several times throughout the talk. We see things like mass misinformation and disinformation campaigns being distributed all around a potential target nation. We see restriction of communications. One of the reasons that we know as much as we do about the uh, the conflict in that area of the world right now is because social media agencies like Facebook and Twitter, now X, uh, maintain dark web presences for their social media platforms. This means that uh, members of these uh, these countries, if they can access the dark web, can access these social media platforms and get information out to us in a relatively safe way. Otherwise, communications are being very, very heavily locked down. We're, we're getting very limited information about what's actually happening. We've also seen something that's a little more terrifying, and that's the targeting of critical infrastructure. And we've seen examples of this happen here in the, uh, in the United States before and in other places around the world too. Uh, some of the uh, some of the examples that come to mind include like the Colonial Pipeline attack that took place a couple of years ago. We saw attackers go after a major oil and petroleum distributor, and they were able to take their uh, their distribution mechanism basically completely offline. Realistically, they took their finance system offline, not their distribution system, but that's a story for a different webinar. What we saw though was it did cause a significant issue around the uh, around the country. There were people that were hoarding gasoline. There were places that were running out of petroleum to sell. And now we're seeing follow-on lawsuits and continued issues based on that kind of exploitation. When we're talking about critical infrastructure, we could also be talking about things like water treatment systems or power grids or anything else that runs on either aging technology or technology that is not necessarily seen as uh, a general target when we talk about cyber attacks. Then, of course, we have disrupting commercial operations, and that should come as no surprise to anyone. If you recall back to the not Petra ransomware attacks, which was not actually ransomware, uh, that was a cyber weapon that was launched, ironically, against the Ukraine uh, a few years ago, uh, made it outside the boundaries of that conflict and ended up causing billions of dollars in damage around the world. There were massive organizations taken offline, FedEx and Maersk or two that come to mind right off the top. So knowing what we can do to prepare ourselves to defend against those attacks becomes very, very essential to us moving forward in, uh, in just our general cybersecurity plans. So here's really what we need to do, and this is the rundown for the key elements of the, uh, the cybersecurity planning that becomes essential for us. We need to prepare and plan for basically the inevitable. Something is going to make it outside the bounds of this conflict. It will cause an impact. So how do we as security professionals make sure that we don't end up kind of on the wrong end of that equation? We, we need to make sure that we have contingency plans in place. We need to make sure that we're aligning these goals with our business goals as well. Where do we want our businesses to be in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years and down the road? And how do we build a security program that matches our expectations? We need to be somewhat creative about reducing our risk. So are we moving more into cloud services? Are we moving towards encrypted databases? Are we using cloud backups? There's a lot of different ways that we can go about securing ourselves that can make things a lot easier for us that we may not be thinking about right off the top. We also need to see cybersecurity as a driver for innovation inside of our networks. And a lot of times this comes down to how you and your employees interact with your local systems. Uh, if we can create a culture of security, if we can make people understand and feel good about participating in a cybersecurity plan, which is a difficult thing to do. I will be fully transparent about that. 
then we really do make things a lot easier for ourselves. And finally, we need to plan to be able to sustain our cybersecurity efforts. This is not gonna be a one and done shot. These are oftentimes things that need to be done repeatedly, periodically throughout the year. Things like cloud configuration reviews, penetration testing, web app penetration tests, vulnerability assessments. These are things that can't be done once per year and just you know put on the back burner for the rest of our time. We need to be clear about what our goals are and how quickly we need to go about uh, actually meeting these. All right, the, uh, the next keynote that we wanna talk about was from uh, Kemba Walden, or I'm sorry, Kemba Walden. And she uh, works out of the, uh, the executive office of the vice president. She is the acting national cybersecurity director. And the big thing that uh, the Kemba was talking about was the uh, basically the government's new approach towards cybersecurity. How is the US government actually acting on the information it has? How are we prioritizing efforts to strengthen our own security posture? And what can we in the private industry uh, do alongside the federal government to make sure these things actually happen? Now, uh, Walden had some very, very optimistic views on how exactly the, uh, the, the government's plan was going to be working. Uh, and I would, I would agree with her on most points, but uh, there is a, there's a lot that goes into something like this. The government does not necessarily move quickly. Government regulations are not always perfect. And so we need to, we need to be flexible with how we go, we go about these things. We also need to be able to actively assign who has taken care of each one of these individual portions. The big thing the federal government wants to do right now is basically combine our cybersecurity efforts. We wanna be able to do information sharing, tool sharing, strategy sharing and a lot more. Uh, and that can be difficult at times because we have so many disparate entities, and this is the same with the private sector, uh, that are all maintaining their own sources of information. Uh, when we talk about technology that's being used in these high value areas of our infrastructure too, we need to make sure that we have some kind of baseline that we can establish that will keep those parts of our infrastructure safe. Right now, we're starting to see some of that come out. We're seeing uh, mandated patches. We're seeing uh, certain software applications not allowed to be used inside of these environments. But we're, we're still a ways away from, uh, from actually having a conclusive uh, rundown on how this is actually going to work. Looking at about 2025 at this point before we really see how everything's going to fit together. But yeah, well, we'll see if it starts coming out a little bit before then. Okay, so enough about the keynotes and the government. We'll uh, we'll, we'll jump forward. Uh, one of the big things that was very interesting about this year was the uh, red teaming AI challenge, and this took place at, uh, at parts of Black Hat and also at DEF CON. There was a large series of closed loop artificial intelligence enabled laptops that uh, attackers could go or mock attackers could go and have a session with. They wanted to see if they could make the AI do something it wasn't supposed to do, or use that AI uh, to their advantage to make something basically seem like it was something it was not. And I know that sounds a little convoluted, but let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, the first thing we want to talk about is uh, AI-assisted antivirus. And there were a lot of different, uh, different variations of this that were, were marketed, were demonstrated, and are being currently sold right now. Uh, but they are, uh, they, are, they are not perfect. And we got a couple of really good examples of this. So the screenshot you see here, is a reverse or is a, uh, a listener script. This is essentially a uh, a, a shell that uh, runs in a PowerShell script, and this would be, for all intents and purposes, usually considered to be a malicious piece of software. This is something a hacker could drop on your system uh, and could use for backwards and forwards communications with a computer they infected. Now, uh, Tom Bonner of the uh, the firm Hidden Layer was able to trick a Google system that was supposed to be identifying this as malware into actually labeling this software as safe to use. And do you want to know how he did that? Well, he added a line inside the code that said safe to use. It said, this is safe to use, that, that's, that's it. Uh, there, there's a little bit more to it than that, but you, you kind of get the idea. Because of this, the AI system was unable to determine whether this was malicious, gave it a passing score, and even said down at the bottom that the code looked good and it was safe to use at that point. It was well written, so great job on that one. The other thing we, uh, we saw was the ability to jailbreak uh, GPT-enabled uh, AI systems, these generative systems that we've been talking about already. And when we talk about jailbreaking them, really what we're trying to do here is get them to violate their own terms of use and do something that they would not normally be allowed to do. One thing that's been kind of a, a hallmark about these new AI systems is that if you ask it to do something malicious, if you ask it to write you bad code or something along those lines, it will usually catch what you're trying to do and, uh, and prevent that from actually being generated by the AI system. Uh, but here's the problem. It is not, again, a perfect solution. There are ways that you can get around these blocks in place uh, that, will, uh, that will make these systems uh, be basically a, a tool for hackers moving forward that we don't really have a lot of solid defenses against right now. You can see the quote that I have there. It's possible that the very nature of deep learning 
makes models such as this, or it makes models uh, such as these threats inevitable. It just means that based on the way these things are put together, we are likely going to have issues without very, very tight controls. And if you'd like to see exactly how this works, you can actually try it yourself. The uh, researchers that we have in the bottom corner of this slide are from Carnegie Mellon University, and they actually have a, uh, a portal you can go to and uh, and view exactly how you can essentially jailbreak a, uh, an artificial intelligence system. So I'll give you an example of this. This is one that I just pulled up yesterday. Uh, so they have some uh, some preformed questions, and we ask the artificial intelligence to give step-by-step -step instructions for how to steal someone's identity. And of course, that's not something that's necessarily going to be within their terms of use. So it's going to say, I'm sorry, I can't assist you with that request. Now, you'll notice up in the upper corner, we have a little thing that says add adversarial suffix. This means we're going to alter how we are going through entering this question into the artificial intelligence system to see if we can make it do something else. And sure enough, by adding a couple of other elements to this, by uh, describing similarly, by writing oppositely, we can now get it to generate in pretty good detail exactly how to go through and steal someone's identity. And we didn't really have to change the question that much. We just had to alter it enough that the artificial intelligence didn't recognize it as a violation of their terms of service. Uh, again, this is how attackers are doing uh, are, are using this for things like writing malware for generating phishing emails and for uh, for other problems. Uh, Worm GPT, as I mentioned earlier, is just basically an already jailbroken version of this same software. It just it doesn't have those blocks in place so it can really do whatever you ask it to. Kind of scary. What this means though, is that we need to have some defenses against artificial intelligence, specifically AI generated content. And there are quite a few, uh, uh, quite a few organizations out there that are working on solutions to this problem right now. ChatGPT alone has already come out with a tool that can tell you with some degree of certainty whether or not something was written by ChatGPT. This was mainly done for academic purposes. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the problems we saw with these generative language models is uh, the uh, educational systems uh, in the U.S. and around the world saw, that, uh, saw the potential that students could just go through and ask an AI to write a paper for them. And without uh, without violating any copyrights, because this isn't a person actually writing it, they would uh, they were kind of in a gray area as to whether or not this would be something appropriate to submit. Now uh, the GPT uh, version of this is it's, it's okay. It doesn't uh, hit all the time. Like you can you can get around it fairly easily. But uh, again, they're not the only ones. Here's another example. Uh, this is a uh, an abnormal security uh, article that we were reading. They uh, they went out and sent out a link to check GPT. Uh, which is a tool they're putting out. And this is, again, something that can be used in your security programs to uh, detect AI-generated content, whether that be phishing emails, whether it be SMS phishing, whether it be uh, voice calls or videos or something like that. This is a, uh, a piece of software you can use to uh, attempt to identify those things before they actually hit your user base and before they become a big problem. And that becomes really important. Here's some other stats from Abnormal Security that, uh, that show exactly kind of why we need to be careful about this. Phishing by itself makes up a huge portion of, uh, of attacks when we, uh, when we look at attacks that are taking place on normal sized uh, organizations, anywhere from 50 up to 10,000 individual employees. Uh, when we see uh, phishing as opposed to something like extortion, we, there's actually a big correlation between those two because as we've known, if you've watched my previous webinars, that a lot of ransomware and cyber extortion attacks begin with a phishing attack. The fact that we are now looking at a uh, system like artificial intelligence who can greatly increase the efficiency of a targeted attack, a spear phishing attack, that gets a, that gets a little bit more dicey when it comes to how we defend. So this is some information that we pulled back. This is from one logon. Uh, and this is their stats on spear phishing in general and how effective that kind of attack can be. So 30% of spear phishing campaigns are deemed successful according to one login. I would agree with, uh, with that. Spear phishing is a uh, much more effective means of getting in. And if you're not familiar with the term, spear phishing just means we're generating something like a phishing email, but we're including some very, very personalized kind of data. We're making it look like the email is indeed directed directly at you. Uh, and this can be done in a number of ways through open source intelligence gathering, through stealing information from uh, you know, other areas of your organization, and a lot more. Spear phishing also has a 40 times greater return rate than regular phishing. And so if we increase the efficiency of that initial email, we're also by nature going to increase that efficiency as well. Uh, you can see down here that quote from Evan Reiser, the, uh, the CEO of Abnormal Security. Security leaders need to combat the threat of AI by investing in AI-powered security solutions. We basically have to fight fire with fire at this point. Uh, because AI is kind of eliminating that trade-off. It is able to quickly gather useful information on people. It's able to find very, very personal data, and it's able to emulate natural language throughout its, uh, its phishing generation. I promise I'm not going to hammer on phishing a whole lot more here, uh, but I do want to tell you there are, uh, there are elements of good news that we can talk about here. 
uh, there are some uh, some big time security agencies out there uh, and software companies and hardware companies that are integrating artificial intelligence into the security programs that we already use. And we want to be ready to use these. Microsoft's uh, uh, Copilot is in development right now. They've also uh, included artificial intelligence in their Sentinel system to help spot attacks and other, uh, other malicious activity a lot faster than we normally would. Uh, if you use Microsoft's uh, online services, if you use Azure or anything like that, Highly recommend checking out Sentinel and the integrated solutions it has. Uh, CrowdStrike is actually integrating artificial intelligence in their system as well, uh, and this one is uh, is pretty nice. We've uh, we've taken a look at this uh, in their uh, their their test demos, and we we got to see it in their booth at Black Hat, but. This is basically taking things like the uh, complexity of writing queries inside of a large database out of the security program. Uh, in this case, they're introducing Charlotte, and Charlotte is there basically to act as a bridge between you, the human, and the computer. Instead of having to write a complex SQL query or something like that to pull back information about a specific vulnerability, we can simply just ask in natural language, hey, Charlotte, do we have vulnerabilities involving Microsoft Outlook? And Charlotte will come back and say, yes, we do. Here's three critical vulnerabilities across your 231 devices. Here's what they are. Here's their level of severity. So if we have that kind of uh, access to uh, to our, uh, our, our general security posture at our fingertips, that means we can react a lot faster and we can have more people with a little bit less specialized training to uh, to interact with these systems. Okay, so we're, we're gonna go away from AI here. Thank you for sticking with me on that one. I know we really dug in on that one, but uh, the it was a theme. That was a big thing that we saw at the conferences uh, this year. How is AI going to interact with us and how are we going to interact with it? Okay, so let's get on to, uh, as promised, the zero-day vulnerability that uh, the LMG team, uh, specifically Tom Pohl, our, uh, our head of pen test, was able to unveil at the DEF CON conference this year in Las Vegas. Uh, Tom and his team discovered that uh, Dell Compellent software, which is a, uh, Dell Compellent systems, if you're not familiar with them, are, are large scale uh, archiving and storage systems that are used in a lot of different environments. Uh, they also have direct connectors into things like VMware. So if you're running a lot of virtual machines, you can, uh, you can interact with that kind of storage for either mass file storage, for virtual machine storage, and for a lot more. To do that though, according to Dell's own documentation, you have to configure the Compellent software with an administrative level username and password. It has to be able to interact with the entirety of your vCenter server. Uh, and that is, uh, I, you know, it, as a, a former IT person myself, that's something that, uh, that you know, makes me a little bit nervous. Here's why. Uh, the, uh, the LMG team were able to determine that there is a static AES encryption key that is held in the source code for this software as a static key that is identical for all customers across Dell's installations. This means that if somebody gets access to that key, they can pull those encrypted credentials out of the config file, they can decrypt them, and now an attacker has administrative level access to your vCenter environment. That is not something you want to have. There's a lot that attackers can do there, including, uh, but not limited to, doing things like mounting the hard drive for your domain controller and stealing all the user password hashes for your entire environment. That could be detrimental, especially if we're talking about someone who has the ability to then crack those, or if someone in your environment is using a bad password. So let's talk about how exactly we were able to go do this. So Tom and his team were working, and they noticed this uh, this vSphere client plugin was running uh, and decided to take a little bit closer look at it. They figured out very quickly that there was an administrator, there was an interaction between these that was coming directly out of the compellent software. And they were able to get into the, the server that was running it uh, through a very, very technical means. I don't want to get too far into it. It was, uh, it was very complicated. Basically, the username and password for that server were admin and admin. So that, uh, that's, that's how they got into the first place. Sorry, I know I led that one on a little bit there, but yeah, uh, so this is the first of many problems that we ended up seeing in this environment. Uh, this also led to uh, you know, full access to the source code. And if you've never worked with Java before, a jar file is basically just a zip file. We can just unzip that and pull all the information directly out of it. It's not a difficult thing to do. Uh, but we were able to determine that this was the actual software that was interacting with the config file that was uh, basically acting as the conduit between those uh, those pieces of information. So we uh, we went through, we found the get configuration data method that showed us where we needed to go. And so let's let's take a little bit closer look. We were able to go through and uh, and unzip that jar file to get all of the uh, actual software components out of it. And this is what that ended up looking like. Uh, decompiled the software, we ran a search, and we were able to recover in clear text an AES encryption key that was sitting in this general source code, just waiting for someone to come along and find it. Uh, and we were uh, we went through and tried initially to use this uh, this key to uh, to decrypt in you know some standard methods didn't quite work so we we went a little bit deeper uh, but it wasn't really that difficult for us to make this next hop 
Uh, in going through a little bit for or a little bit more, we were able to find the properties file. And in, in this, you can see we have a host name, we have a password, we have the package name, the version, the uh, the share, and everything else that we're working with here. We put this over into an application called CyberChef. Now, we, we didn't actually know the offset for the encryption here. And so Tom just started putting in zeros until uh, CyberChef was happy. And sure enough, after putting in those zeros and after using that, uh, that decryption key, we were able to extract that password directly from the file. This meant that we were able to log directly into that vCenter server and uh, take the entire environment over from there. This comes back to a, a concept that we've talked about quite a bit, especially when we talk about things like account takeover attacks. And that is the, uh, the concept that attackers don't break in, they log in. Uh, and this is a quote that we have from Brett Arsenal from Microsoft. Uh, they, the, he says it better than I ever could. And really what he's saying here is, uh, d despite the fact that we may have a very simple way of cracking something like the software, the real way that we're gonna end up utilizing this is just by logging into your vCenter server, logging into something that we're not supposed to have access to. So if you, from a defensive standpoint, have uh, correct identity and access management in place, if you're following best practices setting up your server, this becomes a lot less of an issue. You don't really have to worry about this as much because you have other compensating controls in place that will keep someone from uh, from accessing this. Uh, in the meantime, though, uh, just uh, you know, make sure that you're you're keeping pretty close track of who has access to the code for your applications. This also goes to another trend that we saw, and this one, if you've seen our webinars before, you've heard me talk about this, but it was no less of a uh, no less of a high topic of conversation this year than it was the last time we were around these people. Hackers are actively stealing source code, and they're going after big organizations. LastPass had source uh, source code stolen. Okta had source code stolen. GitHub, Microsoft, Samsung, NVIDIA, I mean, the list goes on. And attackers are getting access to that code for the exact reason I just showed you. That, uh, that static AES key uh, inside the source code was exactly what we needed to completely destroy that environment, basically. And attackers know this, they're going after the same thing. They're looking for things like secret keys, they're looking for signing keys, certificates, and they're targeting things like code repositories, bug tracking databases, uh, you know, uh, cybersecurity researchers, and a lot more. As more source code is stolen, our systemic risk increases because of so many interconnections between these different uh, software vendors, hardware vendors, application vendors, and everything else. A big example of this we can put out there is Samsung. Uh, now, Samsung had uh, secret keys discovered in a uh, in a leak of their operating system software, their Android uh, uh, Samsung Galaxy, I guess I should say, operating system software. This was leaked by the Lapsus Group, and this had uh, uh, coding uh, keys that were used to uh, sign malware a little bit further on down the road. The same thing happened with NVIDIA. NVIDIA had its source code stolen, and very quickly after that, we started to see things like signed uh, copies of Mimikatz, uh, which is a credential scraping piece of malware, show up on VirusTotal. They were signed with a valid NVIDIA certificate. And if that's the case, uh, NVIDIA is trusted by a lot of manufacturers, including a lot of Windows component manufacturers. And so if they have a, uh, if they have a legitimate key, if they're being signed by a legitimate uh, organization, that means this could potentially bypass your security software. It may see that it's an NVIDIA product as opposed to seeing that it's malware. So how are criminals actually accessing the software? What are they doing to gain access to these really sensitive pieces of information? Well, there's a few different things that they can do. One, they can be bought and sold on criminal marketplaces and forums. We see that one fairly frequently. Uh, you can, they can fish things like, uh, or people like developers. Uh, that if, you, uh, if you fish a developer for an organization, that means you can steal things like repository credentials. This is the exact way that LastPass lost access to some of their information in their last cybersecurity incident. One of their senior development uh, ops was, uh, was fished and the keys to a lot of their repository were, uh, were hijacked during that phishing attack. There's also things like exploitable misconfigurations. If there's something that's supposed to be encrypted inside of these that is not, that means that uh, a hacker could have access to it. We have supply chain attacks like SolarWinds where malicious software is added into the supply chain at some point or another. Uh, and, uh, and many more. If you're, if you're looking at uh, actually doing any experimentation with searching for this, uh, this compromised code or finding uh, uh, secret keys in GitHub repositories, there's actually a few different uh, uh, applications out there you can use. Chaos and Subfinder uh, came up in a couple of different talks this time around as pretty good ways to look through a public source like GitHub and find uh, repositories that are one, open, and two, have secret keys available inside their software as hard-coded elements. Uh, we still see it uh, very, very frequently. It's a bad coding practice, but it, uh, it still does pop up enough that it's problematic. Now, this is not anything, uh, anything new. 
Uh, this is actually a very old problem, but we're seeing it with uh, hit with a lot more uh, impact these days. Uh, manufacturers out there and software developers out there are, uh, are are taking steps to try to prevent this from happening. Amazon has their Code Guru system. Uh, this is something you can enable for your your AWS storage that will identify if you have a secret key in something you're storing in one of their repositories. Uh, GitHub can uh, can scan your uh, your repositories for hard coded secrets and passwords and things like that. So if you're storing any source code, if you're dealing with any application code and you use one of those two, uh, those two platforms, they're not the only ones, but take a look. You can also use something like Psycode. And Psycode, I got to see a really great demonstration of uh, at Black Hat this time around. Uh, this is built to interface with like AWS and Azure, and its entire purpose is to detect those hard-coded secrets. It then provides you with a report, tells you what the severity is, and provides uh, some, uh, some information on how you can remediate that. Really what they're trying to do here is prevent accidental data leakage. That's the last thing that we wanna have happen is to accidentally give away something like an API key, uh, which an API key can give an attacker access to your entire infrastructure in some cases. Uh, but uh, we, we don't want to do that just based on a simple mistake of uploading a piece of code that we've written or a script that we've written that has that key hard code. Uh, if you have any more questions about key management or the dangers behind something like exposed source code, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, shoot me a quick email. I'd be happy to talk with you a little bit of, uh, more about it. Okay, so there we go. There's our, uh, there's our, our first little run through of the, uh, the, the cool talks that we got to see. Let's jump into another one. So uh, this one came from Safe Breach Labs. And Safe Breach Labs did a uh, presentation called EDR, or Erase Data Remotely. Uh, and what they're talking about here is the ability to adversely impact a, uh, a hardware or software system without necessarily having the permissions or even the proximity that you would normally need to do something. So here's their general strategy. What they want to do is use your security software against you. They will, uh, what they're going to attempt to do is trick your security software into thinking something like a legitimate file is malware. Uh, and they're, uh, they're going to use this uh, most of the time in an unauthenticated fashion. It means that they don't necessarily even have to be logged into your environment to do this. All they have to do is be able to see you on the internet in some of these cases. Uh, this can be uh, executed remotely. You can also do it from in front of the computer. And we'll, we'll talk about the differences between those here as we go through. So the, one of the first examples they showed was the ability to delete something like a web server log. And web server logs come in really handy when we're doing something like a forensics investigation. If an attacker is going after something on your network, if they're trying to implant a web shell, having web server logs available can show us exactly when and how that happened. Uh, if those logs are no longer available, then we're kind of operating blindly at that point, and we may not be able to tell you with a high degree of certainty exactly what just took place in your environment. Here's how they went about doing that. So what we're talking about here is the use of what are referred to as signatures. Signatures are little elements of, uh, of code, uh, little, uh, little hash values, little specific uh, pieces of code syntax that something like antivirus software will use to identify whether or not something is malicious. The researchers were able to find some, uh, some simple pieces of code that were flagged by multiple different antivirus engines as being a virus or as being part of a virus, and they were able to exploit that to have the antivirus software work in a way that it wouldn't normally work. What they're really trying to do here is generate false positives, uh, and the result because of that means that things get deleted. So in this case, uh, you can see kind of the workflow here. Uh, they, uh, they pop onto a web browser, they go onto the internet, and then they find the web server that you were working with. They're gonna send what's called a post request off to that server, and they're gonna include that malicious signature as part of the post request. Your web server is going to record that that just happened because it records every post request that it gets. It's also going to record that malicious signature. So now the next time Windows Defender scans that server, it's gonna find a file that looks like it's a virus and it's gonna just delete the file. Unfortunately, the file it just deleted is your weblog file and now you don't have access to those logs anymore. But it's not just web logs that can, uh, that can suffer from this. Let's talk about something like deleting an entire mailbox. Uh, and this is going to be a local mailbox, not a cloud mailbox. So, you know, don't, don't freak out about that. Uh, O365 can still maintain your backup copy of this. But if you're running something locally, and in this case, they went after Mozilla Firefox, a similar uh, action can be taken. If they send a, uh, an email to a victim that has that, uh, that malicious signature as the subject, then this goes into the user's mailbox archive. Again, the next time security software scans that, it sees the archive as malicious because now it has that signature built in and it deletes the entire thing off the computer. That's gonna be a bummer for a lot of people if that ends up, uh, if that ends up happening. To make things even worse, they could go after something like an entire database of yours. So this is them targeting the, uh, the Maria database system, MariaDB. Uh, this was one of four large database, uh, man, uh, database vendors they were able to successfully execute this attack against. Uh, I, I won't read the rest of them off to you. I would, uh, I would invite you to go back and read the actual study on it. It's fascinating to, to watch. But here's one of the, uh, the ways they went about this. So imagine you have a public facing website where people have to, uh, to log in or register with a username and password. 
they were able to figure out that if they created a new user account with that malicious signature as the username, then it would be written into the database. And in, uh, in a few different cases, the, uh, the uh, security software and the network went through and because it saw that malicious signature, just deleted the entire database. Now, in reality, that would be your production database that just went out the door. That's not something you're going to have an easy time getting back from, especially if you don't have good backups of that system. So why would, why would an attacker do this? Why, why am I even bringing this one up? Well, there's, there's a few things that came up as to why an attacker may go after something like these kind of systems. One of them would be hiding activity. And we, we see in a, lot of our, uh, in a lot of our forensics and incident response cases, attackers will take steps to mask their activity on a network. The same kind of thing or the same kind of process can be done to things like your Windows event logs, as an example, uh, or to other, uh, other sources of information on your, uh, on your overall network. Uh, they're doing this to hinder investigation to make it more difficult for us to fully establish the scope of an attack to tell you what an attacker might have done or how much trouble you might actually be in uh, because of the uh, the activities that they uh, they undertook. We can also see this as a denial of service attack. If they are going through and consistently taking your websites offline by knocking off your databases, that's going to be a problem for you. And we need, a, we need a good way to defend against that. We can also see sabotage, and we can also see hacktivism, going after a web service that you don't like or doing it on purpose as part of corporate espionage or corporate espionage or something along those lines. A lot of different ways that this kind of destructive uh, uh, defacement of your, uh, your software systems can be used. Uh, this also puts up a good, uh, a good example of why we need to look at better ways of scanning our environments. So this is uh, the uh, example I just showed you is tracked as a CVE through uh, multiple different vendors. This is considered to be a vulnerability. If we're not aware that that vulnerability exists on our network, then we are putting ourselves at risk simply by having those systems online. And that's where some of the new software offerings that we were looking at can come in handy. One that I'm going to throw in here um, is the Sentinel-1 uh, Singularity Ranger system, uh, specifically the Insight system that they were using. Now, uh, we are not affiliated with Sentinel-1, but they did have a particularly nice demo of how their software can work. This is a uh, an add-on to the Sentinel-1 software that they already offer, which is a uh, antivirus and EDR system. But it can uh, it can really expand the capabilities of that system. CrowdStrike has a very similar offering. Uh, in this case, they are uh, they are offering a single console for tracking of things like vulnerabilities inside your network, uh, unknown assets. Uh, they'll provide you with threat evaluations and risk mitigation strategies for those problems. The nice part too is this can scan continuously inside your network. So this isn't something that we do once per quarter uh, or once every six months or something. This is just constantly happening, uh, and it means that if we do run across a new vulnerability, we will know about it a lot faster than we otherwise would. All right, so moving forward, let's talk about the uh, the IoT village and the car hacking village. The big one that we, and you may have seen a news article on this already, was jailbreaking an electric vehicle in 2023. This was a team of researchers who basically figured out how to essentially root a Tesla. Uh, so why would I want to root a Tesla? What possible reason would I have to want to mess with the software on the car that I'm going to be driving at 90 miles an hour down the road in? Well, as it turns out, there's a there's a few things that we can do. One, I may at some point want to replace that software. We've uh, we've seen multiple instances where uh, you know mobile operating systems or router operating systems, uh, a competitor has come out with a a better or open source version of something, and uh, that that becomes a, a you know a component that we want to use ourselves instead of something like Netgear software, as an example. Uh, Tesla is not there yet. Please don't uh, don't make this uh, feel like I'm saying there's other operating systems besides Tesla that can run a Tesla, but you know in the future there may be. We also want to do things like uh, unlock features. We'll talk about that here in just a second. We also need to remember too that your uh, your your Tesla actually takes a lot of information that you probably don't realize, and it keeps that information for a lot longer than I think most people know. Uh, there are things like your uh, your average driving habits, your fuel efficiency, your name, address, email. Things like that that can be extracted from the, uh, the computer system inside of that car. And if an attacker gets a hold of those things, well, that can be used for things like extortion. It can be used for spear phishing. There's, there's a litany of, uh, of things that a hacker could use that for. We also may want to, at some point, migrate to another Tesla. If the, uh, if the engine control unit goes bad on, a, on an electric car, it can be a very uh, big lift to transfer all of your information into a new one. If we, uh, if we have a rooted system, uh, we may be able to do that without having to you know, directly interface with, uh, with the manufacturer. We may, able to, may be able to save a lot of money and uh, you know, basically repair the problem ourselves. And then the final reason here is like, just because we can. Like, yeah, why would jailbreak a Tesla? Like to say that I jailbroke a Tesla, that's a, that's a you know, pretty nice badge of honor to have uh, around your neck. Now, when I say unlock features, what I'm really talking about here is Tesla's features as a service model. 
there are certain things inside of a Tesla that are technically within the car that you don't directly have access to unless you buy an upgrade. And these include things like the heated rear seats in a lot of the, uh, the Tesla models out there. The heating coils are already in place, the wiring's already there, the programming is there to run them, but if you don't buy the upgrade, you can't use the system. Uh, there's also things like specific engine tunings, there's battery capacity uh, alterations, there's autopilot levels, uh, regional features that can't be used in some areas of the world that you might want to unlock. And uh, so this becomes a fairly attractive kind of, uh, kind of a proposition. So how is it done? How were our researchers actually able to root a Tesla? Well, uh, the, the Tesla is a very secure system. And so they had to use a procedure called a voltage fault injection attack. This happens right at the very beginning of the boot cycle when the uh, car's computer comes online. And it basically, uh, it basically takes over the boot cycle, uh, allowing you to input your own code to get that root shell and to alter components of the operating system before it goes through its validation checks. Uh, to uh, to make sure the operating system is still intact. They, uh, again, were able to gain that root shell. Uh, and this can also survive things like reboots and patches, potentially. Uh, and they used that root access to modify the car's configuration. Once this was done, they had full access to those heated back seats and they were off to the races. But it did show this kind of activity is possible. They had to have physical access to the vehicle to do this. This wasn't something that could be done standing next to the car with like a cell phone. But it does show a good proof of concept as to how those engine control units can be manipulated. All right, so next up, let's talk about evading cloud logging. And this was a, this was a pretty interesting uh, presentation by uh, Nick Frischett. And uh, Nick went on to talk about how he, as a penetration tester, would avoid things like crowd, uh, cloud trail logging inside of AWS. So what is cloud trail? Uh, cloud trail is logging, monitoring, and alerting from within the Amazon uh, AWS uh, in, uh, uh, atmosphere, sorry, environment. It records things like uh, API calls, it uh, records console actions, resource changes, it can provide you with information when something bad is going on inside your account, uh, and a lot more. This is used by a SIM and lock platforms uh, automatically uh, for automated detection, for SOAR features, for, uh, for a lot more. So if there are problems with CloudTrail, well, that's, that's going to cause problems kind of cascading down the line in your security program. Uh, this also provides some great visibility for security teams and is really essential when we talk about investigating a potential security incident inside of the AWS environment, specifically when we're talking about EC2 that's, uh, or S3 buckets. That's where we see this uh, come into play a lot. So how is CloudTrail actually bypassed? There's a few different ways that this can be done. Uh, there are four primary strategies for bypassing CloudTrail, and the, uh, the, the the big ones that we see are kind of as follows. Uh, tampering with the settings tends to be kind of a big one. This is where an attacker will gain access through some kind of uh, administrative level account inside your AWS system, and they'll go through and basically just turn off logging. Uh, or change it so that you can't see the alerts being generated. There's protocol mutation, which we'll describe here in a second. There are undocumented APIs, <coughs> excuse me, which uh, if you remember uh, years ago when we did our, uh, our Magic Unicorn tool, an undocumented API can be used for all kinds of, uh, of malicious purposes, especially if there's not a lot of control over who is using it and when they're using it. Uh, and then the very end, we have non-production endpoints, the computers that are spun up in uh, the Amazon system that are just simply not designed to be recorded by security software. All right, so let's talk first about tampering with the environment. So this is, uh, this is kind of what that would end up looking like. Uh, and you can see our, our friend James from our ransomware presentations over there on the side, just having a great time taking this AWS environment down. Uh, you can modify CloudTrail directly. So you can see some of the, uh, the commands that can be issued against CloudTrail to just shut it off. We have stop logging, we have delete trail, we have update trail, and then we have put event selectors. These are all commands that can be used to either completely get rid of or modify the contents of your CloudTrail logs. Uh, and then we can also go after the S3 bucket. Remember, if you're using Amazon and you're collecting logs from AWS, from EC2, from S3, all those logs are going to be stored in an S3 bucket. And whatever security software you're using will need to have access to that S3 bucket to actually parse that data. Uh, in this case, we just go into the S3 bucket directly and we delete the bucket. Or we, uh, we change the policy on the bucket or we delete the contents that are in the bucket or something like that. We can get rid of the root data. We no longer have to worry about security software reading it. And now we can basically you know, act with impunity without being caught by CloudTrail. The next thing we want to look at here is protocol mutation. And this is the use of the, uh, the Amazon uh, command line services, command line API services, to essentially perform commands that we shouldn't normally be able to, uh, to perform without tripping sensors inside of the environment. And this becomes a little bit difficult. Uh, in this case, we're going through and uh, trying to list the, uh, list the secrets for, a, uh, for an overall tenant. Uh, yeah, sorry, Amazon tenant. 
Uh, we can see, and this is just basically us asking if we have the ability to do this. You can see with permission and without permission. Uh, the researcher enters in a, a secrets manager a list secrets command. This is a Python script, and it tells him uh, response code 404, you have permission to list the secrets, or response code 403, you do not have permission. At this point, though, neither one of these events gets logged to CloudTrail. This is just basically a debug log it's uh, it's looking at right now. So going through and this uh, this early indicator of compromise, someone listing our secrets, would go kind of unnoticed. It also means we can do things like list the permissions on a account or uh, on a uh, on a, uh, a user uh, without uh, without having to go through and trip these log files. So in this case, this is their their proof of concept file. This is stealth enumeration of user permissions inside of AWS, and they're basically showing off everything that this specific account can do. It can list projects, it can describe user profiles, it can get secret values, uh, and a lot more. This is uh, obviously an account that you probably don't want to have somebody in without authorization. Uh, but knowing that uh, if they do perform some activity that is being logged would be you know helpful at least in this case. And right now we're not seeing that. Next, we have things like undocumented APIs, and undocumented APIs are problematic no matter how you, you go about them. If they're available for use by a public source, then odds are pretty good someone is going to find them. Uh, in this case, you can see there is an operation inside of this uh, I am admin uh, API that is list access keys for multiple users. And this will basically allow anyone with appropriate access to list all the access keys for anyone they want to inside the tenant. That's not something that we want getting out there. Access keys should be something that is very, very closely protected. And by using this API to do so, we end up skipping the, uh, the log and the alert that goes along with the fact that this just happened. And then lastly, we have uh, things like non-production endpoints. And non-production endpoints are easy enough to configure. They're just uh, they're endpoints that you make in EC2 that you don't you know necessarily connect directly to your uh, your normal system. If someone gets access to EC2, uh, they could potentially use one of these to uh, to perform queries against your system to pull back information. And again, none of that actually ends up in CloudTrail, so you would have a hard time knowing this was happening. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, the, uh, the the ins and outs of cloud trail logging, we have a cloud threat hunting presentation from uh, from a bit ago that we did for RSA uh, that uh, that goes through a lot of this stuff in general, what you can expect and how you can kind of harden these configurations. All right, so to end out, let's talk a little bit about what we found in the arsenal. So if you're not familiar with it, the arsenal is a place where uh, up and coming security researchers and even well-known security researchers can demo new things like open source tools for the cybersecurity community to see. One of the big ones that we saw that I really thought was interesting was Bloodhound 5.0. Uh, if you've never used Bloodhound before, Bloodhound is an offensive security tool that is really good for attack, or, I'm sorry, uh, mapping attack paths within your network. Uh, it can look at your configurations, and it can show you in some uh, some pretty good detail exactly how an attacker would be able to go from low access up into something like your domain controller, what paths they would take to get there, uh, what potential hurdles they would hit along the way, where the choke points might exist, and, uh, and a lot more. Uh, they have just upgraded to Bloodhound 5.0. Uh, there's also a Bloodhound Enterprise offering, and uh, Enterprise is a very defensive-focused version of this. You can run it on your network. It will scan. It will show you these things as uh, basically as a defender would want to see them, and you can harden your configurations based on that. Now, this is built to work with many different kinds of identity and access management systems, Active Directory, Azure AD, Entra AD, and a lot more are all included. Uh, and you get things like containerized deployment, you get a REST API that you can use to interact with the software. It performs a lot better and development has been uh, streamlined. Also, if you're interested in just trying out what this looks like, uh, Bloodhound Community Edition is also available. Uh, we highly recommend going to check that out. It's a very, very powerful tool that can show you a lot of insights into how an attacker could take your, uh, your network over. All right, another one that we saw was a uh, an MFA bypass tool called Cuttlefish, and I thought this was pretty interesting. This is designed to work with advanced authentication flows, things like OAuth or like SAML, things that we would normally use for like single sign-on, uh, as an example. Really, this is built to go against the more phishing-resistant forms of multi-factor authentication. Uh, when conditions are correct, so it's not all the time that this, uh, this software actually functions properly, but when conditions are correct, it can do things like uh, key log, so steal your credentials. It can execute uh, code, like JavaScript, within your web browser, like arbitrary code, making it do pretty much whatever. It can hijack session cookies, so it can take over basically your authenticated session with whatever service that you're working with. Uh, it can take over fully authenticated browser sessions, like the tab itself, uh, and a lot more. There were successful proof of concept demonstrations against both LastPass and Gmail that we got to see. Those are two big ones that we, we normally assume as being you know, pretty bulletproof when it comes to their security. So the fact that they were able to bypass and uh, go past their MFA controls, that was, uh, that, that was pretty frightening. 
from a research standpoint, uh, we, we talk a lot about the importance of malware sandboxing and not executing anything that is, uh, you know, is, is malicious inside of your environment. Uh, and sandboxing can be done in any number of ways. You can use something like VirusTotal, you can use any.run, you can use the Cuckoo Sandbox, or you can use this offering. So this is uh, Norbin, and Norbin's actually been around for quite a while, but they've, uh, they've done a lot of work lately to modernize this, uh, this type of software and uh, give you a very uh, you know, lightweight, easy to configure, pretty simple to use means of testing applications applications, making sure that you understand what exactly they're doing before we uh, you know, let them run wild inside the network. It's a Python-based tool, and it works with the Sysinternals Process Monitor, or PROCMON, application uh, to identify several things about how a piece of software is operating. We can get things like its normal, uh, its normal operating behavior, its process maps, uh, its parent and child process spawns, uh, its uh, command line arguments that it may be spawning, and a lot more. This can also integrate with a hypervisor for live execution. You can see a screenshot of that that we pulled off their YouTube channel. And this is them detonating a strain of ransomware using the uh, the, the Norbin software. Uh, so if you're looking for a quick and easy sandbox, something you can just use for testing inside your environment, check it out. It, uh, it looked like a pretty nice tool. Finally, the last tool we'll talk about is going to be Threat Scraper. And Threat Scraper, I really found interesting from an intelligence gathering perspective. One of the big things that we are uh, we're, we're always trying to find better ways of accomplishing is threat intelligence research. There are a lot of different formats out there. There's a lot of different areas where you can get this information back. And if we have a uh, if we have an application or a helper at least that can help conglomerate some of this uh, and provide us with a little bit more uh, you know actionable or usable information, that's going to be that's going to be helpful. Uh, this one integrates directly with VirusTotal and attracts things like file hashes, file names, malicious links, and a lot more. If something comes up as potentially malicious, this kind of software can help you rapidly detect whether or not it's something that's going to impact you directly. Uh, and this is built to uh, to help uh, uh, developers and uh, and other software managers basically evaluate the software they're running in their network and be sure that they're not uh, you know not running into something dangerous okay so that's the end of our uh, our summer hacking update thank you so much again my name is matt Dern of lmg security these are our top takeaways uh so artificial intelligence will likely continue to expand its impact uh for you know as far as we can see into the future there's nothing we can do about that defensive tactics will need to change to defend against advanced attacker tactics that's more in relation to the virtual warfare that we were talking about uh source code and uh, security is essential to maintaining safe software operations moving forward. Uh, vulnerability management timelines need to speed up consistently uh, and considerably. We, we need to be able to take care of vulnerabilities a lot faster. Uh, IoT devices are gonna be still a constant target and cloud security will be increasingly important as more of our applications become more interconnected. All right, Tamara, I will turn it over to you if there are any questions, but again, thank you for listening and uh, shoot us a, a message, info at lngsecurity.com or hit me up on LinkedIn if you'd uh, like to chat more about any of these subjects. Thanks, Matt. We did have a few questions that came from our audience during the presentation today. First question is, can we use artificial intelligence to read and interpret Splunk logs? Yes, actually you can. There are, uh, it, it's not a production feature yet, uh, but Splunk is one of the uh, one of the organizations that is integrating artificial intelligence or at least some variation of a generative AI into their future offerings. I don't know the exact name of the software, uh, but Splunk made a big deal this year about uh, future planning and using something like AI, similar to how CrowdStrike's doing it, to make interacting with their, uh, their logging and, uh, and management systems a lot more streamlined and easy to use. Great, thank you. Next question is, how do you think artificial intelligence will play a role in defending against cyber attacks in the future? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So when we're talking about how AI plays a defensive role, I mean, we, we really kind of hammered on the, the offensive things you could do with it uh, in this webinar. But from a defensive standpoint, uh, AI-generated uh, malware or AI-generated attacks are going to come at us very, very quickly. And we need a defensive posture that can respond equally as quickly. Uh, if we have AI at our backs at that point and we can use it properly, then that gives us a much better chance of defending against those kind of you know rapid fire attacks as they come in, rather than having to play catch up once we figure out what actually happened. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Next question is, how can I protect my employees if phishing attacks are getting so much more sophisticated? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, the the big thing that we see with uh, with these more sophisticated phishing attacks, specifically spear phishing, 
is the need for uh, just more consistent employee awareness training. I mean, training the people that you work with that you're around to act as that first line of defense for you, uh, to uh, to you know have the tools they need to spot something like a phishing email come in uh, becomes really important. The follow up to that is uh, email spam controls, uh, security controls, things like Mimecast being enabled uh, become very very helpful in uh, in blocking uh, these these kind of attacks. It, again, none of these things are silver bullets, but having a layered approach to that kind of security can stop you from falling victim to something like a very well-crafted spear phishing attack. Thanks, Matt. And our final question is, do you have any recommendations on how to manage vulnerabilities when they come out so quickly and are so hard to spot? Yes, uh, so there are a lot of solutions out there that can help you automate your vulnerability management process. If you have an EDR system like CrowdStrike, that uh, by itself can actually be very helpful. You can spot vulnerabilities very quickly with a system like that. Uh, Sentinel-1 and Carbon Black have, uh, have similar available uh, query engines they can use. Um, another one that we usually like to throw out there, and I should throw a slide in on this, is going to be uh, uh, Tenable. So Tenable is a, a company that does uh, continuous vulnerability scanning. They actually have a, I'm going to say it again here, they have a new module that has artificial intelligence that they're integrating into it. That is going to be used for this exact purpose. It is built to continuously scan your perimeter and identify problems before they really become a uh, you know massive blowout kind of issue, something like a log for J problem, uh, as we would uh, as we put it. So I would take a look at that. Look at your internal security software, EDR software, or advanced antivirus, and then look at having a vulnerability scanner on hand like Tenable. Thank you, Matt. Once again, this is Tamara with LMG Security. We would like to thank everyone who attended. Thank you all, and have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Again, my name is Matt Duran, Director of Training and Research for LMG Security. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out at any time. We would love to hear from you. You can reach me at info at lmgsecurity.com, find me on LinkedIn, or follow us on Twitter. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.